Welcome to Higher Ed Live. I am your host, Seth Odell. And as you guys can tell, today we're going live with Livestream.com. It is a uh, opposite solution of Ustream. We're using a competitor. So if you guys can hear me, let me know if it works. The back end is a little different. It's been a little funky. I've been doing my best to try and put the pieces together. So if we're out there, if you're out there and you can hear me, tweet me, man. Let me know. Let me know what's going on, guys. You know the hashtag. It's Higher Ed Live with any questions or comments. And uh, we're going to be displaying what you guys have going on all night, as you can tell. So, as always, what's going on, what you're saying, we're going to be listening to. So, uh, we got already a wow, quality plus one on live stream. Good to hear. Uh, we are working as best we can here uh, with Higher Ed Live to bring you guys the best quality, the best content we can. So, we appreciate your patience uh, with the technical solutions we are dealing with. So, as we before we dive into today's show, right off the bat, I want to thank our sponsors. I'm going to do it a little differently on my end, same end on yours. So let's pull this up. First off, guys, Hybrid Live is sponsored by Integral, the creators of the Schools app on Facebook. Be sure to check out their webinar series about how they can help you leverage Facebook to increase yield and you know what, retention too. That happens this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to send out a tweet with that link in just a second. Going on, another one, guys, right there, Omni Update, the leading web content management system provider for higher education. The company's web CMS OU campus, it's secure, it's scalable, it's got great tools and features and deployment flexibility, and you know what? An awesome user community, too. In fact, it was the highest ranked CMS in customer satisfaction in a 2010 EDU Guru survey. So, because if you need a CMS, check it out at OmniUpdate.com. Com. So once again, guys, welcome to Higher Ed Live. Thank you so much for being here. It has been a crazy week for me. Uh, last week we were live in Albany, New York. I've been in Boston. I was in Chicago in the middle of the week for uh, for the Stay Mates Integrated Marketing Conference. I was in Boston on Friday for EDU Tweetup. I got back into LA last night. You know, try my best today to put together a solution for you that was as ad free as possible, that was as good as possible, and. Uh, I'm ready to go with that. So today's show, we are going to be talking about innovation in education. We're going to be talking about where is the 21st century university? That's the question, right? Where is it? Well, that's the question that we tackled last Friday, just a couple days ago, at the first ever EDU tweet up, and it was in Boston. And I've got the man himself, the founder of EDU tweet up, the guy who put it all together here with me tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and try and bring him on if I can figure out how to do this. So right now, guys, let's say hello. Let's see if this works, guys. Let me know how these transitions go. Uh, so... I'm here right now with Mike Petrov. What is going on? How's it going? Uh, guys, if you can see Mike, let me know. I can see Mike, but it's kind of hard to tell what you're seeing. So, uh, so right. far, we're both here. I'm happy to be here with you. Mike, we're going to be talking about, as we said, EDU TweetUp, which was the subject of this event, was where is the 21st Century University, and that's what we're going to tackle today. So, again, man, thanks for coming on, and uh, I'm going to have some fun with this today. I hope you do, too. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I think we can continue a lot of the conversation I had there, uh, but I'm excited. Awesome, awesome. So guys, we always start at each and every show with a little something that I like to call the Weekly Five. That's right, five stories from around the world of higher education that you know what, you guys better be reading, you better be thinking about, uh, because uh, they're important. Now that being said, uh, I was definitely, definitely uh, a little little behind this week. So it's going to be the Weekly Three. I hope that's okay, guys. I, uh, I got a little behind on things. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is, is uh, the, as my experience at the Staymates Integrated Marketing Conference on Wednesday, um, they had something called Teens Talk. I think a lot of you guys watched. We did a special live broadcast of Higher Ed Live, and it was 19 college-bound teens uh, sharing their experiences with the recruitment process, and it was awesome. It was really, for me, a really good learning experience. I mean, they just sounded off on why they hate marketing materials. They hate some advertisements. They're talking about what they did love, the relationships they had, you know, the campus tours. Guys, this was just so chock full of information, and uh, I think for me it was a real learning experience. Clearly, we we got we know what works, we think we do, but hearing it straight from the source uh, was great. So, guys, if you, if you missed the broadcast, it's archived. We even have a response video of attendees letting us know what their experiences were. You know, it's really great that you know each and every week here in Hired Live, and, and we do this in our own offices as well, that we all talk to each other about what we're doing. But I can't stress enough, guys. Sometimes it's really great just to sit back and kind of listen to students and hear what they have to say. So that's got to go be on weekly one because that, that was just the best 90 minutes of content I've experienced in, in a while. Now, the next one I'm going to have to ask uh, our guest here to help me out with because he just introduced this story to me. I totally missed it this week because I said I was traveling, uh, and it's that Missouri – is now forbidding students and faculty from being friends on Facebook. So I'm going to send a link out to this article now. I did read it, Mike, but let me put you on here on screen together. Uh, what do you think, man? I mean, this. so essentially the, my just of this article was just that 
uh, that it's literally going to be illegal for teachers and students to be friends on Facebook. That's kind of a, a pretty interesting and, and bold move. Well, I think it, it brings up a few different uh, questions for me. When I saw this posted, uh, it was sort of surprising because we usually talk about this as um, – sort of a school policy or something like that. But the fact that it's going into law and the government's getting involved, that's what sort of blew my mind here. And I think it, uh, my biggest issue with it, I understand sort of the need for boundaries and, you know, that possibly things could, um, you know, go into a legal matter if a student and a, you know, teacher had some kind of conversation online. Uh, but the big problem I see here is uh, linking that to a technology or a technology platform. The fact that students and teachers can't communicate through that platform now, the, I know that they say it's private communication by friending. Uh, they basically encourage um, you know, teachers to create Facebook pages for the class or for the teacher to interact that way. I mean, but it still doesn't restrict a teacher and a student to message each other, even if they're not um, you know, friends on Facebook. So I, just, I see this as sort of a dangerous territory for the government to get involved in, specifically in an area where you know, teachers and students need to find new ways to connect inside, outside of the classroom and to you know, basically put aside Facebook and say, you know, you can't do it here, then what are we going to build to allow students and teachers to connect on an easier platform? Yeah, I, I got to totally agree with you. I, I think it's, you know, I mean, I think anything that, I guess what I'm trying to say, there's definitely should be a boundary clearly between teachers and students and their relationships, but, but banning any specific platform from being able to be involved is a scary thing, especially when, you know, I mean, I, I've seen Facebook groups do a really great thing. They work mm -hmm. really well, you know, but of course, face, they say, because in the article it says, oh, teachers can still have a Facebook page where, where the students can like them, but, but if you have a Facebook page, my understanding at least is you can't participate in groups, that, that the mm -hmm. functionality is not there yet. So just, I just hate the idea of anything being all or nothing, and my big question is how the heck are they going to police this? <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, and then, what you know, what other platforms are they going to start policing then too? You know, if they're you know just looking at they they call it um, private social networking. I think in the actual uh, bill that's being passed right now. Um, so you know, they're just you know since Facebook's the big name right now, but uh, who's to say they don't start cracking down on other private networks that you know DMing on Twitter is that allowed? You know, that's the next big question that comes up. So. I just fear that this is going to roll into a territory that we don't want to get into, which is, you know, giving giving teachers a more difficult task to say, how do you get in touch with your students outside of the classroom and get them actively engaged with each other? You know that the students are connecting, but how does the teacher get involved in that conversation? Yeah, totally true. we got a great comment coming in here, too. Let me try and pull it up. Uh, it's just saying, you know, you know, it's not good. Informal student-faculty interaction has strong impacts on student outcomes is a tweet that's mm -hmm. coming. Really good point. And, and, mm -hmm. and that's a real threat when you talk about eliminating that. So I think that's a, that's a very good point to be made uh, out there online. I like that. That's a good point. So, guys, it's uh, kind of nerve-wracking, but that's the way it is in that story. Definitely something to follow. Uh, and uh, But that's weekly two. I said it's weekly three this week. I managed to squeeze out three. It's been a crazy, crazy week. Um, but the third one is actually I'm looking to an article that, that our one and only guest, Mike Petroff, just put out today, and it's an event recap on EDU Tweetup. As I said, EDU Tweetup was this event that we put on Friday. We're going to tell you all about it in a couple of seconds, but just get this link. It's it's using Storify, which if you haven't experienced Storify yet, it's a cool site that lets you track you know everything conversations from Twitter to photos on Flickr and kind of aggregate social conversations into one place. So not only, Mike, i got to play on and say, you know, great job using it in general, um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a great recap. So if folks missed out, I do think that's probably the best place to go for now to get your recap on IR Ed Live. So uh, pretty exciting. Yeah, just, to, just to add something to that, um, I, I would really encourage you, if you're doing any type of engagement with your student body, with prospective students, any marketing initiatives, uh, and you're using Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or um, any kind of social engagement where you're getting a reaction from students, Storify is an amazing tool to try to build out. I mean, I'm not working for Storify or anything like that, but it's a nice way to put a linear context to social media. We tend to just see this barrage of you know posts coming through and you can't keep up with everything, but I think it's a really nice tool to use to try to create a story out of that um, you know social media engagement that you had for that week. Um, so if you just, I mean, just do a, a hashtag search and try to build one and pull some pictures in, but um, I would definitely say use that for your school if you get a chance. Yeah, love it, love it. So, guys, uh, each and every week we have a little something called the unsolicited shout out of the week, where we shout out any person, place, thing, or idea for any freaking reason I want, because this is my web show, and that's what I do. And this week it's going out to, of course, the sponsors of EDU Tweetup. Uh, for the folks that could attend, the sponsors just made it possible. It was a really cool event. You were able to come in. We had a whole section running out of this great bar right in downtown Boston, you know, the college hub of the world. And so, the sponsors, Integral, 
Ex Libris, Edio Guru, Staymates, M Stoner, Academica Group, as well as Environments for Human, Omni Update, New Cloud, and Converge. So, to all of them, I want to say sincere thank you. Uh, you know, I just always appreciate being here for Hard to Hire Live. Some of the things that we do can't be possible or wouldn't be possible without the, the love and support of some great companies that are behind us. And uh, this is a great example of uh, companies in higher ed trying to be a part of the community, trying to give back, make something happen. And I really appreciate those that did that. So, uh, all right, Mike, let's just dive right in. And let's do this. Uh, we're going to talk about innovation in education. Where is the 21st century university? And again, it's all coming out of, e of EDU Tweet Up Boston on Friday. So, so briefly, uh, and Mike, I think most people here are probably aware of it, but just tell us for those that aren't, you know, what was EDU Tweet Up on, on Friday so folks understand the context in which we're having this conversation? Sure. The, uh, the basic idea is that it was an unconference, and an unconference is uh, sort of an informal conference where people get together to share ideas uh, on subjects that might not normally be. Um, you know, people might not present on these because they're sort of risque or they're new ideas or they're innovative. Uh, it basically allows people to connect and start talking about these things. And what we did at EDU TweetUp was we hosted it at uh, McGreevy's, which was downtown, a uh, room that fit about 80 of us. Uh, we all got together and then we had a short series of five minute talks from people that are very focused in certain areas of higher ed to try to get conversation going. And it basically was a networking event. It led to a lot of connections. It led to a lot of people getting really inspired to change the way that we view education, what we're doing with our own schools, and also the, you know meeting other people who are like-minded. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It was a great event. I had a great time at it. And uh, so when, when Mike and I were talking about putting the event together, you know, we said, what's the theme of tonight's event? Because not every EDU tweet is going to have the same theme. And this theme was... Innovation in education, where is the 21st century university? And let's, let's lay out what that means as we dive into the examples we're going to talk about today. Uh, the mm -hmm. first thing I want to say is, you know, I, I love higher ed. I know you guys probably love higher ed as well. Uh, and we all know that there are some, some really challenging times coming up for all of us in this industry. Uh, but I think sometimes, too often, we get a little bit negative on what's happening. And yes, the model is changing. But so are some folks in higher education themselves, and they are making great changes, great strides moving forward. So the goal of the event for the whole night was let's not talk about the negative. Let's not talk about pie in the sky. Here's what we should all be doing and break everything down, change the system. We're all doing it wrong. No, no. There are examples right now today of amazing, amazing innovation successes in higher education, and uh, we wanted to highlight those. So what we wanted to do is spell out lots of little examples of innovation and bring it together because I'm here to tell you guys today that the 21st century university absolutely does exist. But it exists in pieces, in your university and mine, all over the world. Nobody is doing everything right, clearly, but it absolutely exists in bits and pieces. And if we open up and have this dialogue and, and talk about the successes, rather than just being negative about the changes that we have to make, I think we can start to put those things together, identify success today, make it scalable, bring it together, and we can all work together to really move forward and, and innovate and make education what it should be now. And uh, people are doing it already. That's really important. So that's why we wanted to focus on it. And, uh, and lastly, what, a lot of the stuff that we talked about, which is really great, is you know why are we here in the first place? And that, that's the students. Um, so... I just think that's really, really great. You know, we're, we're here for student success. It's important to focus on that. And that's what we really did uh, did with the event. So, you know, we're going to talk right now about innovation and education. If you guys have examples yourselves, right here, guys, I'm going to be pulling up your tweets. And uh, we're going to be going all the way through sharing what you guys have to say, too. So if you guys have examples of success, let us know. Innovation in there. We're going to make it happen. We're going to talk about it as well. So we're going to dive right in right now. I'm going to pull up my man, Mike Petrov, once again. So, all right, Mike, let's dive in with, with innovation and education. Let's start with, with, with like a really basic topic, with classroom changes. Because mm -hmm. the classroom is something that's existed for centuries and centuries. And there are people now that are making really great strides within the physical classroom to change things. Uh, and that brings up to me, I think, you know, Robin's talk. Uh, we, we had mm -hmm. one of our speakers was, was Robin Smale from Penn State. Uh, she's a uh, disruptive technologist. And, and does a lot of cool stuff in the classroom. So, I mean, I was really inspired by her talk. She was talking about, you know, just shaking up the classroom environment, give, empowering students to learn more, um, changing the way they communicate. And I, I just thought that talk was really great. But, um, but do you have anything, any thoughts or takeaways on what she had to say about classroom innovation? Yeah, I, I loved how specific she was in her example where she was talking about how the, you know, use of blogs within a classroom setting now, I know that's been talked about for the past, you know, eight, ten years that students have been, you know, blogging in the classroom or classes have had that. But she applied a very, very specific tactic to it. And she said that the quality of the writing goes up as soon as students start commenting on each other's blogs. It's because students want to, you know, 
show that they're they're smart, that they're well read, that they can post really great content when they know that the other students are looking at that content. So it's tapping into sort of the social aspect of it, but it's also upping the quality of the education of the students because they're all you know learning from each other. So I think where we need to go with what we're doing with technology in the classroom is not just say, well, I'm using blogs in the class, but it's what are you using them for and how are you improving education? Uh, so I think that was a really great talk and it was really good information to see that she's actually applying that to increase you know, the quality of the education, not just to increase the popularity of using technology in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. What very well said. It was a really great talk. And and you know, when she's brought all this stuff up, it brought up some some memories for me, which is the fact that there there are some really cool examples of innovation in the classroom as well that that's come up even here on Higher Ed Live before. Some of you might have watched the episode, uh, which is was covering per, per, Purdue's excuse me Purdue's Studio, which is a suite of uh, of applications, almost all mobile applications that help students in the classroom to learn better. One of them is like, essentially it's a Twitter back channel where students can comment and question. This is something that Robin t uh, tapped on a little bit in her conversation too, which is that allowing students to interact within a classroom, not just verbally by raising their hand and getting the attention of the 25 other students in the room, or, or in some cases in the lecture halls, hundreds. Because mm -hmm. to be honest, when you have an environment where a student is forced to step up in front of a large group of people and comment, that does mean what you're gonna get is you're gonna generally get the people that are more confident either in themselves or in their understanding of the subject. And what you don't have, as you guys all know, is the students that are a little quieter, maybe a little more shy, or the students that don't know if they have the right answer, and they don't want to be embarrassed, so they don't say anything. But by empowering a student to use their phone and be able to actually comment, which is exactly what Purdue has done, this is one example of what Purdue's done. Let's send out some links for more information. You know, they've actually found a way to empower every student in the classroom. So if students, you know, have an opinion, they can share it instantly. And I, I think it's really important that while we want our learning environments, our classrooms to be very forward thinking and, and to, we don't want to push students to be, you know, to step outside their shell a little bit. At the same time, if we don't let a student feel safe in the classroom, it's unlikely they're going to take the risks that are going to lead to true growth, you know, intellectually. So I think this, the stuff that Purdue's done is pretty cool. I'm going to send out a link uh, to, with the interview we did. It was Kyle Bowen is a guy from Purdue. Great guy. They're doing great stuff. This is only one example. But again, that's a great example of innovation and education in the classroom that, that I just think is definitely worth noting. So we got that link out, guys. Again, we're going to be highlighting everything that you want to uh, share with us. We're going to pull up all your tweets. Um, but lastly, I want to talk about one other thing in the classroom that I think, you know, definitely Mike's going to enjoy sharing with me too, which is uh, Friday, we were very happy to say that we, while we charged $10 a ticket for everyone that came to EDU Tweet Up, we were able to donate every penny generated from ticket sales and a little extra, so over $1,000 to the Khan Academy uh, for their efforts to support them as a nonprofit innovating in higher education. So that was something that, that we were really excited about doing. You know, I think Khan Academy is doing something really great, but you know, one thing I want to talk about with innovation in the classroom is that if you guys, you know, if you think Khan Academy is just YouTube videos, you're definitely missing out a little bit. So don't sit back and think that Khan Academy is one guy in a closet making videos. That's where it started and that's awesome. It really is awesome. But that's not all they are now. They have an awesome exercise software. And it's something that they're using right now in K-12 through schools in some test studies. And it's worth checking out. I'm sending you guys a link out right now. And it's really, really cool. And what it does essentially is it's turning the entire model of homework on its head. So we all go to class right now, or sorry, not we, you know, students through K through 12 go into a classroom and what do they do? They get talked to by a teacher, right? One teacher talking to 25 students. What that exercise software does is that turns the model on its head. Your homework is to watch a lecture from your teacher and fill out worksheets electronically where the teacher can then look and actually see, okay, where are you succeeding? Where are you failing? Where are you slow? Where are you fast? Students can learn at their own speed. And then when they get into the classroom, then they're not just getting talked to for 45 minutes or an hour at a time. Instead, that's the time the teacher has to go around, work one-on-one -on -one with students, get students in group thinking creatively about how does this really apply to real life. It changes the in-classroom environment because you've taken the lecture portion and you put that as the homework. And that's something that's really cool because, you know, that's not happening in high Okay, guys, I don't know if anybody's still out there. It does look like we had our first fail of the day with live stream, <laughs> a bit of a disconnection, uh, but I think we are back. I think we're good to go. So if we are out there again, let us know. Make, a sh make sure we all know that, that you're here and you're alive. Let me fix uh, Mike's window here. Got a little disconnected, and uh, we're going to get right back into action. So let's pull him back up. Am I good? Yeah, you know, Mike, we're here. We're okay. here. I don't know if anyone <laughs> else is here. Okay, we're yeah. back. Yes, right. we're back. Apparently, we got boom roasted, uh, and uh, <laughs> it totally shut down. 
So good to know working. But I don't know. Man, I, I just think Khan Academy is really a great example of innovation. Now, I know they're focusing with K through 12, but I do think it's a really good one to note it while we're talking about this stuff as well. And, and the, the inspiration that I got from it, you know, not only from the side of the students and how it's impacting them, but also just seeing it as a success story. Because a lot of us talk about how we want to, you know, build something new or change what's going on. We always look at the model as being so gigantic, so huge that we can't do anything to change it. But just seeing what Saul Khan basically built from his closet, found developers, found people that were interested in it. He didn't have to do everything, but he had to start the idea. And I think that's what we're trying to do now is start some ideas and you know, connect the right people so that something like this can actually evolve and feed into higher ed. You know, if, if we're looking at this as a model and somebody out there in a higher ed school is doing something similar, you know, we have to encourage them to post about it, to share it, to collaborate, to find other people that can do it. Because, you know, you don't want to keep everything siloed in higher ed. You, you basically, we're just trying to educate students, and that's what the ultimate goal is. Uh, so I look at it as an inspiration to try to figure out things that I can do and other people that I can meet to try to grow an idea similar that uh, Khan Academy did. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I'm excited to see how, work, how Khan Academy grows. I uh, definitely am. And again, guys, check out that link I sent out. If you, if you haven't explored Khan Academy beyond posting you know, YouTube videos to learn, check it out because their new software I think is awesome. I'd love to see how that model could work you know, looking at it realistically in maybe a freshman entry level course, courses where teachers are, you know, large lecture halls, things like that. So, and, it, and the thing I like about that is, is really it's about blended learning. We talk a lot about online learning versus on-campus learning, uh, but I think some real successes right now, for instance, Khan Academy Innovation today is proving success of blended learning. And that's an area that I think is really exciting this has huge potential for growth. Um, so that's a really good one. But let's, let's, the next one, guys, we're going to talk about is we had a really great speaker, a good friend of mine, uh, the one and only Tony Zanders from Ex Libris. They are a library software solutions provider. He spoke at EDU Tweet Up and had some really interesting stuff to share about the challenges facing libraries. And uh, I thought that was really, really cool. Essentially, what he was talking about was the fact that you know 70% of today's librarians are up for retirement in the next 10 years. And uh, that's a scary thought. I mean, libraries are totally changing. You know, as you know all too well, Mike, and we're hearing these stories more and more of, you know, libraries with no books, where, you know, libraries where the books are underground and robots go and get them. Pretty cool to read about, but I don't really know if Tron is the future of libraries necessarily. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, what he was talking about was really interesting about finding ways for libraries to be more efficient because, you know, ultimately libraries aren't based simply on, you know, books. Libraries are there to be a resource and to learn. And just one example that, that, that Ex Libris is doing right now is they have a really cool solution they're launching where students can search on their mobile phone for resources uh, that they want to have and they get an on-demand response just like Amazon or Netflix. So when a student types in, I'm looking for a research paper on this, it says, you know, here's the research paper, you know, that, that's your first search result, and students that read or cited this research paper also read or cited these other ones. That's just a really cool example of taking a, a basic innovation technology, which we all know with Netflix with their suggested, you know, rentals or with Amazon with their suggested products, and applying that to higher education. What that means is, it doesn't just mean it makes it easy for students. But it means, in theory, there's potential right now for, for something like that to actually be more powerful than Google or Wikipedia. Because what's happening now is clearly students are Googling and looking for a book or they're going on Wikipedia and looking for an article. But if you can provide an educational environment from their phone, for instance, or from a computer that says not only here's a really great resource, but here's all the other ones that academics just like you at campuses all over the world are looking for, that's an innovation in education right now that's actually taking the reins back on, on library resources. I just thought that was a really cool example that he shared. That was, I thought it was pretty inspiring. And just something to add to that, I think an opportunity that's there for every single college is most colleges at this point have a huge section of computers for students to use in the library. And a lot of them use that resource because it's on the campus network. They can access certain library areas online that they couldn't do off campus. Um, but that initial page, that home page that you set where they're going for information typically is a very, you know, it's very static. It doesn't have a lot of content on it. It doesn't really lead students to different places. That's an opportunity right away to try to give students different areas to check out for research, for you to do um, some of your own research to find out where students want to find information or where you can lead them. Um, so check in with your library. See where they're sending students when they pop up a, you know, a, a computer in there or go to that first home page and see where you're directing them. And I think that would be an awesome opportunity uh, to find some change there, to look for something new to add to the research that they're trying to do. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So now we have a great question coming in. So uh, coming in from uh, the one and only Mark Greenfield saying, you know, what are your thoughts on the future impacts of MIT's open courseware? And uh, funny enough, Mark, that's right here on our list to discuss. So we're going to skip right down the list just a little bit. 
And uh, we're going to talk about that for you right now. And as we talk about this, we really got to bring up uh, the talk that Michael Feenan gave at EDU Tweet Up on Friday. He is, uh, if you guys know Michael Feenan, you know, he's an EDU guru. He's from Pittsburgh State, is it, right, in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he's also co-founder of New Cloud. But he talked about remixology. Um, and it was talking about you know, what's the future of content ownership and copyright in higher ed. And you know, there's a lot of examples you know, outside of higher education about wh what does it mean for copyright, creative commons. Um, but absolutely, the big example is open courseware from MIT, which is you know, obviously, guys, you know, we did a whole show on this back in the day. Ten years ago, they decided we're going to open up all our courses and essentially start giving away as many courses as we can completely full with video online for free. Uh, and clearly, as we know, 10 years ago, it didn't hurt their brand. If anything, it's helped. People are relying on that. People are learning from it. And it's really hitting true to their mission, which is you know, we want to educate we want to educate people. And if you want to educate people, then then this is the way to do it. So I brought this up at EDU Tweet. If I even said, you know, if you're from a public university in particular, specifically, if your mission statement says to educate people, it really, what's the barrier of access? If you have the ability to educate everyone in your state, for instance, what's holding you back from doing that? Do they have to enroll and pay you money to do that? I, I think MIT's example is, is really exciting. It's an it's still 10 years later an amazing example of innovation education. I think there's, there's pressure to join, which I think is really great. We're seeing more and more schools follow suit. Mm -hmm. um, and we did a show a while back on a product called Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y. It's a startup in San Francisco. Uh, it's co-founded by a, a gentleman, uh, uh, Gagan Biani, really, really smart guy. I think he used to work at TechCrunch. He's been all over the place. Um, but that's a, a, a literally a, a software solution that does that for you, that you can go on and host your classes. And that's an example of innovation in the sense that if you want to do an open courseware, there's almost nothing for you to build. They're like the YouTube for open courseware. It's very easy to go in, plug videos in, put in files, upload things. So it's e the, the barrier for entry for an institution is, is, is dramatically reduced. And that's a great example of innovation today. Um, I think it, it, it's really exciting. So the thoughts for me is that, you know, it seems slow growth, um, but as we start to see people, more and more people trying to get educated without the degree, it's going to become more and more useful. And that's going to be a shift that we're seeing that, that not everyone anymore needs to feel, has the need of, I need the degree, I just need the knowledge. Um, and that's something that we're going to see more and more. Interesting enough, that brings up, actually, I, I should just say next week, uh, we are talking with uh, with Anya Kabinets, the author of, of DIYU and EDU Punk's Guide to a DIY Credential. And that's exactly the kind of stuff that she talks about, which is getting a degree without getting the degree, getting the information education. So I think mm -hmm. there is going to be a big shift. And I, I'm excited mostly with things like Udemy that, that, again, the barrier for schools to enter is, is dramatically reduced because the technology exists. It's not that hard anymore. Um, but I don't know, Mike, do you have any thoughts on open courseware or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. I wanted to bring up another example of a school that I think is just starting to get rolling on this. That have They've been doing a lot of things with technology that have blown people's minds, and uh, it's Biola University. Um, they have this new thing called the Open Hands Initiative. Um, I'll tweet out a link now that I was watching before, but it's basically a presentation. But they had this very large technology summit where they brought in a lot of speakers to talk about how technology is changing the classroom. And this is a presentation where they were talking about how they wanted to basically – um, aggregate all of the current content that sits on iTunes U and YouTube video and other online platforms where people are, you know, exchanging information. And they wanted to find a way to present that to an audience that wasn't specific to just one platform, like an iTunes U or a YouTube EDU, what it probably should be, you know. Um, I think that's just another idea that a school has to say, look, you know, we're not going to um, put our content in one channel. We're going to bring it all together and provide it on our site for you. So it's in the beginning stages, but I would definitely recommend after the show, maybe check out that video. It's like an 18 minute presentation. Uh, but they got some really, really interesting ideas on how to um, you know, bring education into the future online. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, very cool. I totally agree. So we got just a comment coming in. I'm going to try and keep up as best I can. Uh, with everything going on with Twitter, guys, uh, just, you know, interesting stuff saying, you know, curious with the assumption that students are or would be using their smartphones to do research uh, using liberal uh, library resources. I think it's a really interesting question about, um, you know, whether or not folks really would be using their phones. I, my thought is from understanding Ex Libris' position is that is that it's better to be there uh, early than not to be there at all. That I think, you know, mobile is clearly going to be a massive player for students. And if they're, even if they're not doing resources, researching resources now, that I think they want to be there when they are. Um, and obviously, all their solutions are available as well, uh, obviously, as well online and with a traditional computer. But I think, you know, mobile is going to change a lot. Whether it changes how students do research, that is an interesting question to think about. Uh, so, and then uh, we're going to keep going, guys. Let's keep getting into these tweets. Why not, right? Marx, is anyone else concerned about the future of liberal arts education? Is there too much emphasis on vocational training? Uh, 
that's a really interesting question. I think in some ways maybe, um, but I think it, it, that's an institution by institution thing. But generally speaking, yeah, I'm very scared of liberal arts stuff. I'm, I'm scared when I hear about things like SUNY Albany, uh, you know, eliminating entirely, you know, some of their language programs, anything like that. That that does worry me a lot. You know, that 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 worries me, uh, you know, considerably. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that that's a larger, larger question going on. And I could add to that a little bit because yeah. I, I work at Emerson College, which is a very interesting combination of a. A vocational, I don't want to call it vocational training, but a very specific training in communication of the arts programs with a liberal arts context to it. Um, so I think students get a good mix of both learning a craft and applying the liberal arts context to that craft. So getting a really, really good um, educational base that they can then apply to be able to speak properly about whatever um, issue that they want to talk about to be really um, you know, encourage to, to be open about new ideas and, and explore for more information rather than just to be locked into a specific type of learning. Um, so I think that's where we need to maybe readjust where we apply the liberal arts context. Uh, maybe it, it won't survive as just its own major or its own school in the future, but maybe it can be applied as a background of learning for students that then move on to vocational training or move on to a more specific craft after that. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Really good point. So, uh, one thing I want to mention too, actually, Michael, we're on the topic. We we're still we're still roughly connected to open course. We're at the moment, I think. Uh, love getting distracted by Twitter, though, guys. Keep the questions and comments coming. Seriously. Uh, uh, one was, you know, while we're talking about things like open courseware, if you notice, what we're not talking about with innovation education is is things like iTunes U and YouTube Edu. Um, and, and that's tough to talk about because just a few years ago, uh, you know, iTunes U, YouTube U, they were being heralded as being innovation and being really innovative for the education space. And, you know, Mike, I don't want to speak for you, but, but I, I, everyone knows I did a show on YouTube U on why mm -hmm. I felt that it failed. I don't think those are examples today of innovation education at all, actually. Um, and that's interesting because I think that's definitely a shift from, from the fact that they were considered innovative just a few years ago. And I mean, YouTube, EDU, whatever it started, I, I would love to know what happened in that first meeting and that discussion where they said, we're going to launch with a directory of colleges and post their content, and it's supposed to be educational content. Um, that would have been, that was a great idea. I don't think it actually happened. I think it became just a marketing tool for schools to be able to put more content in their channels and wrap their channels in a pretty wrapping. Now, I love it. I use it. I think it's a great marketing tool for our students, um, but I would love to see like, you know, Udemy came out, there's other options out there. We need sort of this, you know, whether it's a Microsoft or an IBM or something like that, somebody that can support the scale that it needs to grow to for all of higher education to be a platform where we can host this content where students can easily find this online content for learning and not just promotional items for colleges. So I think, you know, we failed a little bit because we didn't put the right content into that. Um, we kind of got a little bit greedy, but I think also the, 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 the idea of EDU on YouTube or the idea of iTunes U is bigger than the actual practice of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I just think that uh, it, it's, I mean, I love YouTube EDU. I love this stuff. I really do. But it's an, it's an example of the fact that also we're relying on companies that, that have a much different focus. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, that is why I, I always have loved, there are a lot of tech companies that focus primarily on education and I do enjoy that. There are some big companies that don't but have really great examples. I'm going to mention you know, even Zipcar later, companies that have found a way to fit into higher ed and make it work. But, you know, it, it is tough because those are things that, that could have been really innovative and they just haven't evolved. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. But it's important to note because, you know, when you talk about innovation, it's so easy to, to stick with what's glossy or cool. And, oh, YouTube EDU is really great. It's cool. But, you know, let's talk about real innovation because I think mm -hmm. Udemy has a much larger impact. There's the potential to. And when you look at Khan Academy software, that's way more impact as far as educational video goes. Um, so I think it's really important that when we're having these conversations, we're not afraid to say what we think does and doesn't work because, you know, this isn't an all or nothing thing. It's okay for us to pick and choose the innovation we believe is truly working on the ground today. And I think it's important to have that conversation. Um, and, and guys, by the way, while we're talking about this, I want to talk about one thing with Mike too, which is um, social media success stories that, that again, just a couple years ago, social media was getting a lot of buzz for it's really cool, it's innovative, what's Facebook for, it's neat. But today, we're actually seeing examples of innovation in higher education where, where social media is being used and, and it's having some actual tangible results. And it's not just the result isn't it's cool, but the result is actually it might be actually helping our students succeed. And that's a very different conversation. Um, so, you know, one example of that, honestly, is one of our sponsors, Integral. And, uh, and they are doing a really cool thing with their schools app to work with students. 
um, to essentially try and get students into school, have more friends, have a bigger support network. But considering their sponsor, I want to take a step back for a second and ask Mike because I know he's worked with them. Tell me about your, your experiences with social media and you know, and student success and student recruitment and everything, just in general, as well as you know, your experience working with, with Integral as a, as, a, uh, as a partner. Sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, I work in enrollment, so my main focus is working with incoming students and prospective students and making sure that, you know, retention is up when students come here so that we're finding the right students, they're connecting with each other, and trying to find the tools that allow students to feel safe at a college, to feel like they're part of a community, uh, because all of that goes hand in hand with better learning and uh, more involvement with campus. So we based, I, I, I approached this year with using three different tools just because I wanted to see what worked and what didn't and how different things worked. So the difference between a Facebook page for incoming students, a Facebook group for incoming students, and using the Integral Schools app. Um, I, have, I have a post that I'm going to try to do later on in the summer about Integral and get really in-depth of what the difference is with the content and the conversation with it with the students involved in each. Uh, but I just wanted to throw out a couple stats of why I think that we need to focus on things like Integral and what they're producing or other apps that allow students to connect. Um, right now, uh, through that app, I can tell how many connections students have with each other. We have 940 students that joined the Integral app. Um, it's a private community, so they can only get in if we allow them in. Um, sometimes what happens is a private community, it'll drop off right away. Everybody will join, everybody will say hi to each other, and then they fall off. I can tell you out of that 940, we've had 212 of those students still logging in within the past week. And this is over the summer when it's a very dead time. They're all excited to come here, but 212 students within the past week are still all talking to each other within this app. Um, and that grows and shrinks, but that's just last week's numbers. The other thing I did is I, I went through and I found out how many students were connected to each other from within the app. Basically, you can tell within the app how many, how many friends a student has at the school, so within the Emerson network. And on average, within that 940, every person has an average of 17 friends that are also at that school. So that just goes to show you that if you go into a school knowing 17 people, that's more than I know that I ever knew. Even though I went to a local college, I didn't know 17 other people from my school or other schools going to that school. So I just, I, it, it goes to show you that these apps that connect students, we have to look at them throughout the next three or four years and build that student group as a cohort to say, well, did it actually help with retention? Or is it just kind of a, a fad that's going to go away? Um, I lean on the side that I think that we need to do more of this, whether it's on Facebook or other platforms. Um, but it just it just shows you how powerful of a tool this is to actually connect students. So by the time they get to campus, they know each other and they feel comfortable in that environment. Yeah, you know, I, I could not agree with you more. I, I really can't. I just think what you're bringing up, what I'm hearing, you know, we talk about that something that's talking about student connections, you know, just an example, if you're using a tool like that to have students come in with more friends, you know, three of the five top, three of the five top reasons students drop out are related to having a successful supportive network, and that's what mm -hmm. friends are. And then mm -hmm. that's a very real thing. Uh, and then, so what you're talking about is social media innovation today is not something that's cool or something that's shiny or something that's different, but something that's tied in directly to your core goals as an institution. Uh, just to put another example, um, if you guys might have seen, I wrote a post somewhat recently for Higher Ed Live, probably a couple weeks ago, on a company called RoomSync, and they're a roommate matching service. Uh, and they work with schools to match students. Essentially, before they come to campus, they can match themselves with someone else that they think is compatible before they come to campus. So they kind of have a, a say in who their roommate is. And the, the interesting thing about that is the, the initial numbers that are coming in are showing that, that it, it's, it is looking like it may have the potential to actually reduce roommate conflicts, which is one of the top five reasons students drop out. And I'm not saying that's even how far that's the case. Things are so early. But what, it's, what that defines to me and what I'm hearing when Mike talks about, about integrals is – that's defining how we should define success. Success isn't students use it and it's fun. Success means is roommate matching on Facebook literally leading to a higher retention level? Is it leading to student success? You know, is integral built, giving a network for students to come in with a stronger foundation and therefore succeed? The question of, of are these things successful is falling on our core goals, which is getting students into the institution, getting them to be successful, getting them to have the best positive experience they could, and then sending them off into the world. So, you know, when we're talking about these social media platforms, the, the innovation that I'm seeing is that we're actually seeing companies come in and they're starting to hit those core goals. That what they're actually doing is they're playing directly into our missions. And, and that, to me, is true innovation. And that's really, really cool.
And I think, you know, there's that balance of using it for your own marketing. I think Nick posted earlier that it's it's a way to hook schools to or hook students into your school, which I think social media is a great way to put content on a platform that's easily shareable and easily, you know, allows people to comment on it. Um, but what people are finding now is that what's a stronger marketing tool is letting your students talk to each other, letting people talk to your current students and opening that curtain. And that's a great platform to do that. Um, and we need to move on from there too. I don't think that's where we stop and we say, great, we have our students talking to each other, take it to the next level and actually apply some data to it and do some tracking over the next five years, start now while it's really popular and look in the next five years and say, did these students graduate? How successful were they? How involved were they? Uh, if they were more active in social media versus less active. And I think that will help our enrollment modeling. It'll help what types of students that we recruit to our schools. So I, you know, I try to tell everyone and now start tracking your information so you can look at it and actually come to a conclusion whether or not it helped your university's goals or it was just a fun thing to do. And you know, you kind of paid attention to it for a couple of years and then stopped because it wasn't working. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, so guys, to pull it back a little bit into the EDU tweet up event that we did have Friday, again, we were tackling this, this very question of examples of innovation education, where is the 21st century university, there was a really interesting talk uh, from Eric Stoller, who is the host of Student Affairs Live, my counterpart here at Higher Ed Live. He's also a blogger with Inside Higher Ed. And he gave a talk on accessibility. And, and again, I, I didn't want this show to be a negative one. I want to focus on innovation. But he did bring a very real point that, that there has been a lack of, of innovation for the large part in accessibility. And as we talk about all these examples of innovation, so many of them do fall on technology. And there's a real fear, I think, that we're leaving students with disabilities behind. And that's a very scary thing. And again, there are examples of innovation. Just one example, YouTube now offers the, you know, the automatic transcription services for your videos that you can opt in or you can go in and manually put in your own. Um, but the, the hard thing is that not a lot of people are doing that. Uh, and, you know, as Eric said, you know, so poignantly, you know, Google can't see. It's smart, you know, SEO to do this stuff. Um, but it is an example to bring up. I just want to, you know, cite it because his talk was really great. I hope we can get the audio or the video up from that talk so you guys can experience it. Because, you know, it is a true thing that, that having any of these examples of innovation, a lot of us are still waiting to see where is the innovation with accessibility or is that just simply rely on us, you know, coming through and delivering this for our students. It's a really interesting problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, now let's go through. We still have a couple other random examples of innovation, too, I want to hit up. If you guys have your own examples, let us know. Um, but, you know, one thing, Mike, I want to bring up is something that's in your neck of the woods. They're based right out in Boston is Zipcar. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people might have – guys, actually, you know, I'm going to go ahead and write ask. Uh, you know, uh, so, guys, is there Zipcar on your campus? You know, does that exist? Because there's one at UCLA. It's really cool. Not just one. It's, it's there. And they're actually putting cars all over campus. For us, it's Priuses. I'm not sure if it is for everyone. And essentially, it's like a rental car system that Zipcar works with colleges. And what it does is it reduces demand for on-campus parking. You know, it, it, it reduces congestion. And it's a sustainable way to actually kind of reduce your carbon footprint. You have students essentially sharing and renting the same shared car. And Zipcar is a cool example of a very small of a company that, that's clearly not just focused on higher education, but coming in and saying, you know, we can provide a solution to a very small problem because that's kind of one of the things we talked about at the event was, you know, we're talking about lots and lots of little solutions that are scattered all over the place. And it's, it's about trying to collect these and work together and have this dialogue to put the pieces together for something bigger. And I thought, you know, Zipcar was a pretty cool example of that. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, just, uh, just to add to that, yeah. I know, you know, it's tougher in an urban campus. You know, I don't, I don't see an application for something like that in Boston for our students that live so close to campus. But I think it's really interesting to see um, this move now from private companies out there, you know, that their goal is ultimately to make money. And, you know, for a lot of these colleges, are their balances as our goal to make money or is it to help our students learn? And I, I like to think that, you know, we try to lean towards helping our students learn, but seeing how these private companies can come in and support education at a school. And I think that's what we're trying to do right now is make these connections and not feel like, you know, there's this vendor school relationship uh, that's sort of strained and, and goes back years and years for how many vendors that we try to work with. But looking at these um, opportunities with these private companies that do something very, very well and trying to bring that into the higher ed context and see it grow within that, you know, it's, it's just really exciting to me. Dude, I, I could not agree more. You know, and you're actually kind of leading into what was going to be one of my takeaways. Um, and, and, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and dive into it right now. You're talking about, you know, these vendor solutions that clearly there's companies out there that, that are looking to make a profit, but they're finding ways to partner with higher ed. Um, it's so easy in higher education to hate on vendor-based solutions. It really is. Uh, and, and clearly, I know a lot of some vendors are salesmen, some are good, some are bad. But 
I think too often we write off third-party solutions because they don't come from in-house and because they're not higher ed, they don't know us. But you know, when I look back at some of these examples, you know, you're seeing you're seeing you know companies like Integral have real success and and potentially really impacting a student's story and experience. You know, companies like Ex Libris are actually bringing you know the resource searches back to the libraries away from Wikipedia, giving students the best resources they can. You know, again, zip cars coming to campuses. There are a lot of examples in what we just talked about today. I'm looking through the list right now that aren't mm -hmm. just in-house. And again, like Purdue, amazing mm -hmm. in-house produced applications. Clearly, we're not saying it's one or the other. But when you look at this list of innovation, Khan Academy is an outside nonprofit. When we talk about innovation education, to simply deny an entire section of the industry because they don't have an EDU at the end of their domain is so mm -hmm. unfortunate. And it mm -hmm. happens so many times. And one of the things I loved about the EDU Tweet Up event on Friday is that we were able to have this cross collaboration dialogue, talk with people, because there are companies out there that are doing great things for our students. At the end of the day, I don't care where the solution comes from, if it's the best thing for our students, the best thing to fit with our mission statement, with our strategic plan. If it fits in, it works. And I think if we want to have true success, we have to acknowledge innovation wherever it lies. And, and I was really happy that it happened at EDU Tweetup. I hope it happens more um, because I think we need to start heralding these companies that are investing in education, that are trying to make a difference, you know, regardless if they're an institution themselves or not. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to go, sort of go back to, we also had Scott from Inside Higher Ed Talk, and he talked a lot about um, you know, open discussion, open collaboration, and you know, if you have a good experience with something, writing about it, being part of the conversation, and bringing it up to those administrators that are making the larger decisions for the college, you know, and not just let them dictate decisions, but go out and you know, be forceful and write posts and explain what you're doing and how it's innovative, because I think that's that's what leadership is about, and that's what he was speaking to. That you know, leadership isn't the position that you have at your school; it's all about you know, the voice that you have and the ideas that you have. So I think like what we need to do within education right now is reach out to these companies or build internally and talk about it, collaborate more and not just hide it within our university. So I think ultimately that's just going to lead to people feeling more comfortable moving forward or moving ahead with technologies that they may say, well, we can't do that yet. Not many other people are doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so yeah, Scott, uh, one of the things we had with that EDT, we did have, you know, Scott was one of the co-founders, an uh, editor of Inside Higher Ed. Uh, Jasek, uh, I got his last name correct, Scott Jasek. He mm -hmm. is his talk was really great. It was just a really mm -hmm. great talk about about you know leadership in in the 21st century university, and so much of it rang true to me. And uh, I, one thing I want to highlight, just was a little off topic, but you know he just hammered the fact that we can't feed the lists. There are mm -hmm. so many best of lists and best in class, and you know top ten this, top ten that. And we need to have our own discussions. We need to stop feeding into this kind of media BS because I agree. I mean, I've said mm -hmm. from the get-go, I really am not a fan of U.S. News and World Report. I, I, I don't think it, it delivers what it should. So many institutions spend so much time just trying to chase a little ladder and not trying to chase student success themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, leadership is going to be everything because it is examples of leadership and, and pushing things forward. Innovation is going to make a difference. Just one, one example that may or not be right, you know, I mean, Jason Woodard just said, you know, uh, that Ithaca didn't couldn't get Zipcar. Zipcar wouldn't come, so they ended up forming their own. Now I don't know who at your institution did that, but that's a great example of leadership. That here's this example of innovation. You couldn't make it happen the easy way, so you go ahead and do it the hard way, and you do it yourselves. But that's awesome, rather than just closing the door on it. And you know, it's just little stories like that with leadership that's going to make a big difference. Uh, so I just thought Scott's talk was really great because in the end of the day, obviously. You know, we have a lot of things coming, you know, as Mark always says, because I know Mark Greenfield's watching, you know, higher ed's going to get flattened. He always says, you know, a lot of changes are coming. I'm, I'm in full agreement. Um, but the ones that are going to survive, the ones that are going to have strong leadership, they're going to identify this innovation early and are going to progress on their own will, not forced by the market around them. So, guys, this is kind of wrapping up a little bit for us here with, with where is the 21st Century University. Um, before we do, I'm going to pass it to Mike for any final takeaways. And uh, I want to see if you guys have any other thoughts. Please pass it along. Let's, let's try to, to t keep highlighting. If you have more ideas of innovation, send them to me. Even after the show is done, I want to hear about it. But, you know, Mike, any last thoughts on innovation and education? Well, I, I, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the sponsors again and everybody that attended the EU tweet up because it was one of these, you know, small idea, big idea kind of things that we didn't know if we could pull off, but a lot of people were interested and I think we got a lot of people talking to each other and it sort of planted the seed that these kind of conferences need to happen around the country um, all the time. So, uh, you know, I'd say keep an eye out on future announcements for possible other EDU tweet ups. Uh, we want to try to bring these around the country, get more people involved, get some tech people involved. Uh, get other colleges involved from every type of very every background, whether they're public, private, online, and just start talking about where education is going to go in the next 10 years. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, guys, 
if you couldn't make it to EDU tweet up, you know, at Boston, you did miss out on an amazing night. I got to say that it really did, you know, it was really inspiring to be in a room full of that many people that, that care so much, you know, that, that cross collaboration from all sorts of different backgrounds, you know, people that were, were vendors that were in higher ed people. I mean, there's people there that weren't even directly in higher. They're just interested in being a part of the night. And that was really cool. And mm -hmm. I think we need to have these dialogues where we come together and talk about this stuff collectively as an industry. Um, and the good news is, you know, I, I'm talking, I'm pulling them right back up on screen so you guys know. I'm, I'm talking with our guest here, Mike Petroff. We've been talking. We're going to try and find a way to make this stuff happen again. And, and I'd like to think, you know, the next time we do it, it's, you're all going to be a part of it because we're going to have an entire virtual component wherever we do it. Mm -hmm. So whether you can be there or not, it's not just going to be a physical location thing anymore. It's going to be totally virtual. You guys can participate in person or online um, because I think these kind of conversations are really important. And, and I think Kyle James said it really well online during the night that, that, that night on, on Friday, ED Tweet was the kind of night where you can have the conversations that you can't have elsewhere. Um, they're hard conversations. I mean, there were some very hard topics going on, talked about throughout the event space, you know, and, you know, if you saw Eric Stoller's speech, I'll have to put the video up. He really went off and, and, and really hammered home some lessons. And I, I think that it's this kind of collective, competitive, fun, exciting environment that we need to work together and have these kind of passionate conversations. Uh, and I really hope we can continue to do it in the future. Mm, definitely. So guys, innovation and education, bottom line, my final takeaways is we got to stay positive. I know there's a lot of negative talk about higher ed. There's a lot of terrible things going on. It, it disgusts me, the cost of tuition, how it continues to rise so much, how states have abandoned their public institutions. But we need to focus on positive examples of innovation, and we need to look at them like seeds. And we need to plant them wherever we can, and we need to collect the pieces because bottom line, what do I think? Where is the 21st century university? Is it exists today? but it exists in pieces. And it is only dialogue and cross-collaboration and community that's going to allow any of us to bring those pieces together and really build something substantial that is going to actually be the 21st century university. So, uh, Mike, thank you so much for being a part of the show. I really do appreciate yeah. it, man. And, um, you know, my thanks to everybody at home for watching as well. Guys, keep the dialogue going if you want. Uh, it's really, really uh, important, and I really want to hear what you have to say. Keep using the hashtag as much as you want. And then, of course... Please be here next week for a really great conversation, the EDU Punk's Guide to DIY Credential. It's going to be really great. We're here with author of DIYU, Anya Kamenetz, and it's going to be great because, you know, Mark's asking a lot of questions out there now. What's the role of the 21st Century University? Are we here, you know, are we here to educate? Are we here to get students jobs? These are the kind of things we're going to talk about next week. We're going to talk all about that. Do you even need a degree anymore? Can you go ahead and just get yourself your degree without that piece of paper for free online? What does that mean, and how should traditional institutions react? That's what we're talking about next week. It's going to be a loaded show. Guys, we got a big August coming up for you. Please keep tuning back. Uh, again, this is Seth O'Dell for Higher Ed Live. My thanks to Integral and Omni Update, our proud sponsors. My thanks to Mike Petroff for being the guest today. And finally, my thanks mm -hmm. to you guys for tuning in. I will see all you guys next week. Until next time, take care.